Hi everyone and welcome to Call FX and the Disappearing Times. Boo! My name is Nikolai, let's dive right in. What if I told you that you can turn this Java code into this Java code? Ugh. Crazy, right? But it's true. Java 10, which ships in March 2018, will include a feature called Local Variable Type Inference, which allows us to use var for local variables instead of the type name. Let's have a look at this. If you prefer reading over watching a video, I also wrote a blog post. And if you'd like to experiment yourself, I also created a small demo project and put it up on GitHub. You will find links to all of this in the description box. While you're down there, subscribe. Now, let's get going. Here I have the example that I showed you earlier. Where I create a URL, callfx.org, which is my blog. Smooth, huh? Then connect to it, then open a reader, and then stream the first couple of lines from the output, which, not be surprising, it looks like a header of an HTML page. Great. Now let's use var. Well, it's pretty easy. Just replace the type of the local variable with var. And there you go. Let's run it again. Still works. Same result. So that's one use case for var. There's a second one, which centers around loops. Let's say I have a list of numbers and I want to iterate over it. So usually I would write for int number in numbers. Well, I could have used, of course, used the for each that was um, added to list in Java 8, but here you want to use a loop so I can show you this loop feature. And in a loop as well, you can replace the variable type with a bar. In this specific case, that's of course no big improvement over int, but if there's a longer type name, you can see why you might want to do this occasionally. And this is also true for for e loops, where I can go for e from zero, as long as it's smaller than the size of the numbers, increase and then print There you go. And now this should also print one, two, three, like twice. Yes, there we go. Great. So as you can see, you can use var for local variable type and for types in loops. So what does it mean? Does it mean Java turns into dynamic language? Is it no longer your statically typed Java that you were used to? Don't worry, it still is. In fact, that's exactly what var says. It says, it tells the compiler to infer the type and use it in place of the, instead of the one that you have to type yourself. If you go into the uh, target folder and open the variable type inference.class file, then the decompiler, IntelliJS decompiler, will decompile the code that we wrote. And you will see that this are exactly the types as I would have put them in. You see URL here, URL connection here, your buffered reader here. This is the stream pipeline, which is a little bit more, um, you know, more complex. But then you see the list of numbers here. And then, okay, this is the for each loop, which goes into a while. But then in the for e loop, you will see once again the type that I was too lazy to type. So on the bytecode side, nothing changes. At runtime, nothing changes. Performance wise, nothing changes. This is only a pure compile time feature where you tell the compiler, and further type, and then put it into the um, put it into the place where I would usually write the type. So, how does the compiler do that? How exactly does it infer the type of, for example, in this case, code fx, the variable? There are myriad ways in which it could do that. It could do very complex things and try to align different assignments and try to find the most general type, but it doesn't do that on purpose. What it does instead is it looks at the right-hand side of the declaration. And if there's initializer there, there, it will simply use that type as a type of the variable. So in this case, it's a URL. In this case, it's the URL connection that comes out of there. So this is actually pretty simple. It's very locally scoped. It's very easy to uh, know which type will be inferred as long as there are no complex generics involved. But by and large, um, this is fairly straightforward. The reason for this was 
that there was the, the, the goal is to not create so-called action at a distance errors. What do I mean by that? Let's say somebody wrote some code like this, where you have an ID, and then if the ID, I don't know, is smaller than 50, then do something. And unfortunately, this is a lots of lots of code. Could be its own method, maybe not, maybe it's mutating a lot of state and can't get into its own method. Doesn't matter now. Let's say there's lots of code here. Now, if I go down here and say I want to assign ID to a new value into this, I will get a compiler, right? Because I said that int would be an integer, ID would be an integer here. Now I can't assign it to a string. Okay, that's good. That's what we used to. If I put var here, I get exactly the same behavior. The value, uh, the ID's type is inferred from 100, which is an int. If that were not so, if instead var would try to do something clever and try to generalize um, over which assignments ID got, so it's got an int here and then it, down there it got a string and what are the, what are types, both of these are both comparable, they're both serializable, so you could technically come up with a type that would fit both of these assignments. In fact, let's just do that here, um, dope, like this. Now the assignments work, and if var would, would infer this, the assignment would work, but now this breaks up here. So with regular code, that's not a problem, right? If I write comparable here, I write this, and I see it doesn't work. But if var would infer comparable, then now everything, sorry, put this text spit out, now everything would be an integer. ID is an integer, the comparison works, everything's just fine, and then lots of lots of lots of lines of code below, I reassign ID, and if var would try to do something clever, it would then reassign the value up here, which would break this comparison. And that would be weird. You would be changing code in some place, in a totally different place, and in this horrible case, very far away place, something breaks. And this is what var tries to, um, or what, what var successfully prevents, by choosing just the right-hand side to come up with the type for the variable. So this means this was an action at a distance error and var prevents this. How, let's have a look at some other details of var. Um, if it takes a right-hand side of an assignment, then what happens if the right-hand side doesn't really have one? Right? You can do this. You can say, create a new integer array, and we put in the values one, two, three, one, two, four, sorry. And IDs and IDs. This works just fine. But we don't have to be that complicated, right? We can be smooth and do it like this. Does that work with var? No, it does not. The reason is that when you write it like this, the right-hand side doesn't have its own, its own type. It's a so-called poly expression. It could be various types. Let's have a look. For example, you could also assign it to a long array or an integer array or maybe even a byte array. Yes, works too. So the right-hand side doesn't have its own type. It depends on the left-hand side what type it will get. But if the right-hand side doesn't have a type and the left-hand side uses var, then this is not going to work. And that's the reason why if you use if you use these array initializers, var won't work. There's a great, a big, there's a big other use case for the, uh, this scenario. If you want to have um, a lambda, say, let's say we create a function from string to string, oh, and we call it append, and when we get a string, let's call it append space, we say we return the same string with the space. Once again, the right-hand side doesn't have its own type. The right-hand side's type is inferred by the compiler depending on the left-hand side. So, now we're in the same situation as we were with the array initializers. This won't work. And the same is true for method references. So, var only works if the right-hand side, if the expression on the right-hand side has its own definite type, which is not the case for method references, for lambdas, and for array initializers. So far, we've only used var in the scope of a method, and that's exactly its use case. 
So you cannot, for example, use it in a method. Let's say public void print takes a string, oops, and then prints the string. So in this case, we can't use var. First of all, it's not really clear how you want to infer that type from call sites or from within the method, but in any way it doesn't work. And the reason for this is pretty clear. If you compile code against this class, against variable type inference, and you call the method print, and it takes a string, then at the call site, it will be denoted what you want to call, namely variable type inference print takes a string. If that method is not there, because say I change this to int, then I will get a runtime error. Now, when I have to change the, the type manually, then I should be aware of this. But the risk with var would be that the type could change without me noticing it. In that case, I will create binary incompatibilities where my library or jar or whatever could suddenly not be used anymore without me necessarily realizing it. So that would be a bad place to be in. Same is true for field. Let's say I have a protected field, which, you know, is some string. Same is true here. If this is a string, then the implementing class is safe to use it as a string. If it turns to a var, I might accidentally change the type without really realizing it, and then implementations of this class would break because they think as is a string. Now you could say that for private fields and private methods, this argument does not apply. So why not use it here? And technically that's possible, but the consequence would be that as soon as you turn a field from private to let's say public, you would have to remove the var. That would make the feature rather weirdly scoped to say like it works but only works for certain kinds of fields and Java generally doesn't make that distinction. It doesn't matter how you treat a field, whether it's private or public, if you want to, whichever type you use, however you want to initialize it, all of that um, happens regardless of, how, of the visibility. And the same should be true for var. It should not apply to private fields and private methods, but not apply to public methods. So that's why it doesn't work there either. So, Summarizing the technical details, var works only in local methods, oh sorry, only in methods for local variables, and it works by inferring the type from the right-hand side, which is the reason why it doesn't work if the right-hand side doesn't have a type, like a lambda expression. You can also use it in loops, but not outside of a method, not in, uh, not for, uh, not in a method signature for um, parameters or for return types, and not in fields, just here. With that covered, let's talk about readability. So what about readability? Are types an integral part to reading code? And I'd say yes, they are. Of course they are. So var starts at a disadvantage by removing those types from the code that we immediately read. Of course, IDEs will likely have a way to, to overlay the types, um, but that doesn't happen in all circumstances. Think about code reviews, for example. So definitely var removes some pieces of information and that could hurt readability. But I think it has a chance to make that up. The most important aspect is that it aligns variable names. That might sound like it's a small detail, but I think it's not. Um, when, you, when you read a code where one type is an int, which takes up three characters, another type is some monstrous business domain type, which has like three generic parameters, then you end up with maybe like 80 characters just for the type, and don't even add wildcards, and suddenly you have to like jump very far to just get them, just get the um, variable names. And ideally, those are the most important parts. Ideally, the, the variable names should tell a story that you can follow to get to glean the, the general meaning of the code without going to too many details. So, quick poll. Have a look at this code and now uh, at this code. Which one was easier to understand? The second, right? You could guess quicker what was going on. Well, it was just a wordplay, but still, you could, it's easier to see how uh, the variables relate to one another than it was with the first example where the code made the variables jump, variable names jump all over the place due to long type names. Another thing that should stress variable names is that a type is a general construct. 
either created for the entire Java ecosystem, if it's a JDK class, or for a specific use case, if it's a library class, or even just for your business domain, if it's an application class. But whichever way, it was created as a general concept, which likely applies in many, many different situations, because you're not using a type just once. But the variable name is different. The variable name captures the very specific content context in which you write that code. So that would be within a method, in this specific case, this is not just the list, but these are users, for example. So the variable name can be more concrete and can give you more information than just the type. And so I think that focusing on variable names and improving those even further can make them so specific that the type really does become a secondary information. And paired together with the type not making the variable limits jump anymore, so you can clearly read them, I think this could improve perform uh, <laughs> performance, not readability very well. The other aspect is that because variables hurt readability less, particularly if wildcards and generics are involved, I think you might declare actually more of them than before. So if, for example, you have a complex stream pipeline, maybe you would like to capture an intermediate result in a local variable. That can be rather painful because it can be really long type, which doesn't really help reading your code. With var, this gets much easier. So now you can have um, maybe a stream pipeline or when you enter the stream pipeline and get to an optional pipeline or when you enter that and get into your actual type that you want to use. Um, I sometimes end up having all of these in one chain because each intermediate type would have been so unreadable, frankly, that it wouldn't help anything uh, to have a local variable there. I think that could be different with var because then I have the freedom to um, declare these types and use a very short handle for that, just var, and make um, the variable names stick out and make them more readable. So yeah, I think actually var can improve readability, but only if used judiciously. Sometimes um, the, the type is essential information, and in those cases you should not use var. I think it would be hard in the beginning to tell one case from the other, and I think that the community as a whole, but specifically each team, has to come up with its own rules to decide when to use var and when not, and then hone these rules during code reviews, during pair programming, and just come up with a general guideline that fits each team best. So yeah, I think in that case var will help a lot. In summary, Java 10 ships in March 2018 and comes with local variable type inference, which allows you to use var instead of a type name when declaring a local variable or a loop index. It does not work on method parameters or method return types or on fields. It works by telling the compiler to infer the type from the right hand side of the assignment, which means it's still in the bytecode, which means it's still a statically typed language and nothing changes at runtime. While removing type names may look like it hurts readability, I actually think var can improve it. It neatly aligns all variable names, which makes us focus them even more while writing and while reading code. Either way, I think teams have to come up with their own rules on how to best use var in their specific context. And that's it. Thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, please don't forget to subscribe or follow me on Twitter where I'm at NipaFX. Last but not least, if you want to learn more about Java in general and Java 10 in particular, have a look at courses.codefx.org. So long! Crazy, right? <laughs> Crazy, right? Uh, uh, worst production ever! Uh. 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 Hi, my name is Nikolai. Ha 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 